Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Kami Dogu Podcast. I am Christopher Belgianovsky, and joining me for this extra special episode is the man, the myth, the legend, Toasty. Toasty! So very nice to be with you again. Back when I started Kami Dogu in 2005, I was in absolute love with Mortal Kombat Deception and its conquest mode. Toasty and I didn't know each other back then, but it became clear after a lengthy chat one day that he also felt the same. The game's story, combatants, and the concept of the Kamidogu themselves captured us, and to this day, it's our favourite storyline in the franchise's 30-year history. Hey everybody, it's so nice to be here today. As Chris is sort of hinting at, this is a dream come true for us. Uh, if there's one thing in Mortal Kombat gaming that me and Chris are both obsessed with, it's the atmospheric, incredibly addicting Mortal Kombat Deception. Deception is commonly labeled as the best 3D era MK game out there, and that's something I'll have to strongly agree with. I'll never forget receiving that game's premium edition on Christmas and being glued to the TV screen for months and months on end. It introduced us to a fresh new character named Shujinko, voiced by Max Crawford. Shujinko, for me, was one of my favorite new additions to the 3D era. I thought he was a lot of fun. He had an interesting concept behind him, and I loved seeing his grand story play out in the Conquest mode. It is with great pleasure to be joined by Max today. And with that being said, let's switch over to the interview. Okay, combatants, we are now accompanied by Max Crawford, who famously played the astonishing new leading character, <laughs> Shujinko, and Mortal Kombat Deception. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you bet. My pleasure. So, to begin, how long uh, did you work at Midway Games? Uh, what were your feelings when they went under? And by chance, were you offered an opportunity to move across to Netherrealm Studios? Um, I started working not for Midway, but for Williams Electronics. So that was just through a temp job. And uh, um, I got a job in the part sales department. This was back in the day where they were still making pinball machines and arcade cabinets and that sort of thing. So if somebody in Kansas City, Missouri broke a joystick, they'd call and we'd ship them out a new joystick, things like that. And then <laughs> um, after a while, not too long after that, uh, pinball and arcade went under and... Uh, yeah. So it just all went to um, home gaming. And uh, so after the arcade and pinball portions of the company went under, um, it looked like everybody was going to lose their jobs. And mm -hmm. I was at the time, I was seeing the CEO's administrative assistant. Uh, Neil Nicastro was the CEO of Midway for a long time. And I was seeing his administrative assistant and i guess neil called over to the creative media department and said give uh give her boyfriend something to do <laughs> so so they they transferred me over to creative Re media where i'd actually been trying to get in for a long time because that's really where my, my strengths lay and so i started working in creative media and i was a i was a a, a game capture guy and i would play the games and capture it on beta tape so in the movie the 40 year old virgin in that oh, yeah. scene where Paul Paul Rudd and Seth Rogen are playing Mortal Kombat, that's footage that I got. Oh wow! So oh, so wow. they're not really yeah they're not really playing during that whole segment. They're just like using the controller and the camera is shooting the footage that I got. So I did that for a while and uh, promotional stuff. Went to EC uh, E uh, E three and uh, yeah. stuff like that with the company to set up monitors and help uh, promote the new games and then. I left creative media uh, because uh, Warren Wilkes, have you met War uh, Warren Wilkes is the head of uh, quality assurance at NetherRealm. And he and I were friends then. Uh, he was like, hey, do you ever want to do testing? And I was like, I absolutely want to do testing. So I came back in that regard. And that was, I was working there when I was approached to do the voice of Shujinko. Um, I had no idea the breadth of the character when they asked me, but I didn't, I certainly didn't realize that Guy's got a lot of lines throughout this <laughs> oh, yeah. through conquest <laughs> mode, all of it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh that's how I ended up there. Um and then I think the last game that we worked on before Midway went under was 
the last MK title was MK versus DC Universe. DC, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then yeah, I was devastated when Midway went under. Not yeah. not because you know I was I was not going to be out of a job. It was because you know this is. I was born in 1970, so I saw it all from the ground floor. I mean, imagine five years old, I'm playing Pong and thinking to myself, it's not going to get any better than this. And then <laughs> and then, ultimately working for the company that made Mortal Kombat, which was so huge when I was in college. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately becoming a permanent part of that world in Shujinko. Um, yeah, it was amazing. And yes, uh, I wasn't asked directly by the team, but I was part of the testing team for Midway. So when testing became necessary for NetherRealm, Warren was still in place as QA head there. And uh, Warren gave me a call and said, hey, you want to come test for a while? And I was like, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Um, can you recall some of the cooler projects you worked on? Um. Yeah, as far as, I mean, not directly worked on in a developing sense, but the things that I, I grabbed footage for and promoted. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of a game called The Suffering. Oh, yes. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah. a, it was a, a horror, right? Uh, it was, it wasn't survival horror. It was action horror where you played a guy okay. who was, yeah. who was in prison and, yes. uh, yeah, and he has to fight all of these entities that come back that look like forms of, of capital punishment. And it was a really good game. It was a really, really good game. Um, there was a sequel, Suffering the Ties that Bind. Um, Shaolin Monks was amazing. Sha- oh, my Mortal yeah. Kombat Tell Shaolin Monks. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. I, that's one of the things that kills. I wish we could get an updated version of that. Yes. Because uh, fans are dying yeah, for that. <laughs> I, I would love for that. Or uh, Fire and Ice, which was the proposed sequel with yes. Scorpion and Sub-Zero that I would also yeah. love to see come to come to fruition someday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, PsyOps, that's that's a pretty well-known one for being a game that, that just went under the radar and was exceptional and way ahead of its time. It was. Ended on, and ended on the most egregious cliffhanger ever and never saw a sequel. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there were the, the ratio of cool products to not cool products at Midway was pretty uh, pretty much on the very cool end. There were a couple... There are a couple of stinkers that slipped through the, the cracks. <laughs> did you do Black um, Side Area Fifty One? <laughs> oh yeah, 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 <laughs> okay. yeah. I did. I did actually the first Area Fifty One and Black Side, not the not oh. the arcade Area Fifty One, but the one that had Duchovny's voice yes. in it. David Duchovny played the lead in it, mm-hmm. and uh, it was funny because he came to play the game uh, in San Diego in, in the Milpitas office, and he'd never played a PlayStation before, so he has the controller on the desktop, and he's using. The two joysticks, like it's Robotron, <laughs> and he's pressing the button like it's an arcade overlay, and and he was just flummoxed by the fact that something could sneak up behind him, and I'm like, dude, you're Mulder. Things sneak up behind you all the time, <laughs> but yeah, um, but, but I like both of the Area 51 games. They were a lot of fun. Um, they were the sports games. I did voices on the Blitz football games, the Blitz the uh-huh. League. Oh. I, uh, the first game I was the rookie quarterback and in the second game I was the voice of several of the coaches that introduced the teams so I mean and, and if you could see me uh, it, you you laugh at the irony of me playing a football player because <laughs> I don't I don't have the build for it at all but apparently I have the voice for it <laughs> uh, were you first introduced to Mortal Kombat while working at Midway or were you in fact a huge fan right from the beginning I was a ridiculously huge fan. I was in college. Okay. It was ni- 91, 91 or 92. And I'm sitting yeah. down in the di- in the dining hall and my buddy Carl comes in and he goes, have you seen the new game in the lobby? And I said, no, I came in through the back door and he goes, it's like Street Fighter, but you can kill the guy at the end. <laughs> and I was like, really? And we went up there and Midway, because they were based in Chicago, would sometimes test their games at places in Illinois to test them out, to get a, a testing ground for it. I'm not sure if this was the case, but I'm thinking it must have been because there was a guy there playing the game who I'd never seen before. And he seemed to be a little old to be a college student. And he was really good at this brand new game. And he was doing the fatalities. So I was like, this guy's a ringer. And I think he's he's here showing off the product. But um, yeah, we, we 
played the hell out of that game in the lobby of Corbin Hall. And then Mortal <laughs> Monday came around when the NES version and the Sega Genesis version were coming, the Super NES version rather than Sega yeah. Genesis. And Carl and I, the same guy that told me about it, we had rehearsal. We were both theater majors. We had rehearsal at one o'clock on Sunday, but we had called around to all the Toys R Uses in the area. And there was a Toys R Us in the Quad Cities that was willing to sell us the game a day before Mortal Monday. So we woke up early, got in the car, drove way too fast and way too far (laughs) to get it one day early, then came back and got to play it for like a half an hour before we had to go to a five hour rehearsal. So yeah, we've been, we've been, uh, I've been an insane Mortal Kombat fan since the minute I saw it, since the minute I saw it. It's just, it's uh, very, very cool. So another little side question, who did you commonly think was like your favorite character beforehand? Oh, in the first one, uh, Scorpion. Okay. For sure. For sure. Um, and the second one, I was all over Baraka. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> but third, thir- the third one was uh, Cabal. And Cabal's yes. the one that's been mm. my favorite. It's been my favorite ever since. And I, I remember <laughs> when they had asked me to do the voice for Shijinko, um, I was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. It's a shame Cabal's not in this game. And they had, Cabal was in that game and they hadn't given us any assets that showed that Cabal was in it. I was like, oh, Cabal's in it. So I was really psyched about that because I love Cabal. (laughs) It's a shame what they did to him in the latest movie. I'm just going to leave it at that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, So being a massive fan of Mortal Kombat, do you still keep up to date with the franchise today? Day one, every time. Yeah. I'm a day one purchase every time. In fact, um, I just rebought MKX for my uh, gaming PC. I already have it. I already have it for the PS4, and I think I have it for the Xbox One as well. But I got a new gaming PC within the last year, and I was like, you know what? I don't want it to switch over console to PC, so I just got MKX, which is my favorite one because uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I wish I could have worked on that one because, you know, Jason Leatherface, this, these are yes. horror icons <laughs> that, I mean, Leatherface has always been my favorite. I always thought about oh, how cool would it be for Leatherface to be in a Mortal Kombat game. And yeah. then it happens in the one right after I left. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's okay. That's, I'm just glad it happened. Yeah. Yeah, I thought Mortal Kombat X was great, too. It was very, very dark. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I thought it was, it was pretty good. MK11 uh, really switched things up. But, um, yeah, what did you think of uh, MK9? Did you enjoy that one as well? Yeah, yeah, that was... Uh, yeah. I, got, I was just doing creative media when they started working on MK9, and at that time, the QA department at Midway was four guys. Four guys, like, almost in a broom closet. It was Warren, <laughs> Warren Wilkes, the guy I mentioned, and three other guys that were in there. And they only had... At the time that I tested it, they only had Reptile and, I believe, Scorpion to test. And this was the first time any of us had seen the x-rays because MK9 was the first one to have the x-rays. Yeah. And I got done testing it after I'd seen that. I went back to my friends in creative media and I said, this new MK game, they're not going to round. This is yeah. seriously <laughs> violent <laughs> stuff going yeah. on here. And I was super impressed by it. I was super impressed by it. And I don't know if you ever played the uh, the Blitz games, the football games, but they had those, those x-ray breaks as well. And mini games where you had to like aim a hypodermic needle full of steroids into an injury <laughs> so that the guy could get back out on the field. Midway was cutting edge, man. I loved I loved the chances they took because those blitz yeah. games happened at a time where EA owned the license for the NFL. So nobody could do an NFL football game. So while everybody else said, okay, we won't do a football game, Midway just said, you know, screw it. We'll make up our own league. <laughs> And they did. They made up a whole bunch of different teams, some of them with very profane names, if you thought about it for a couple of seconds. <laughs> and uh, and they made this ultra violent. Uh, I mean, you could you could send prostitutes to your opposing team's hotel rooms so they'd be a little more tired the next day. <laughs> I mean, it, no stone was left unturned in Midway's depravity. It was really, really impressive to a certain extent. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, now, so. Clearly, you you voiced um, Shijinko, who's mm-hmm. it's such an iconic role, and obviously oh, one that you hold on to forever. Um, yes. But did you happen to voice anybody else in either Deception or any other Mortal Kombat games? Um, I did voice. I did the voice of Shang Tsung in Shaolin Monks, and oh. I did Shaolin. I did a uh, Shang Tsung in Armageddon. It's my voice while they're fighting at the pyramid. Uh, uh, when Liu right. Kang gets his with, gets his hooks into Shang Tsung and he's trying to reach the yes. pyramid top, that's me screaming. 
Um, ah. I did the voice. I did Cheng Sung in Deception and uh, the voice of Onaga also. And I had completely forgotten about that until about a month ago when I was just, I fell down a more, an MK rabbit hole on YouTube and I was watching all this stuff, all the bosses ranked or whatever. And I saw a fight against Onaga and I was like, oh, that's me. That's me saying <laughs> that. I forgot about that. But yeah, I voiced Onaga. Um, it's funny in the uh, opening for the Shaolin monks, uh, more, uh, MK Shaolin monks, the opening cinema. Um, I'm doing the voice of Shang Tsung, and at the time I was dating a girl who was really into that Fox show, The OC. I don't know if you oh, remember yes. that. Yeah, it's about yeah. fifteen, maybe twenty years ago. But um, there's a point where Shang Tsung throws a fireball, and the instruction is always: don't try to make it sound like an actual language. Just use gibberish to make it sound like some kind of spell casting. So, if you listen mm -hmm. real carefully, um, when Shang Tsung throws his fireball in the opening cinema, I go, "This week on the OC," <laughs> like that. And that was that was for the is girl I was. Is? That's what it is, and that that was for the girl I was dating at the time. We are no longer dating. I'm, I'm, I'm now married, but that was for her and. I guess she wasn't impressed because because uh... there's, there's so much gibberish with <laughs> Luke Kang and Raiden, and a lot of those are a complete mystery to all of us. So oh. it's awesome to hear like now that we've heard that. I I know the end part, the OC bit. I I can hear that in my head right now. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but it's this week on the OC. Um, but you got to uh, in, in MK3. I mean. Carlos, when he does the throw is Raiden and he says, Oh, I'm going to throw you over there. That's, that's pretty plain. <laughs> that's yeah. pretty, you can, oh, I'm going to throw you over there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It just sounds like Midway was just a, a bunch of fun. Like you guys just oh had a blast God. doing what you did. It, it was an incredible amount of fun. It was an incredible amount of fun. Um, and I do, I miss it sometimes. I, I, every time a new MK game comes out, it's always like, ah, oh, it would have been great to work on that. It would have been great, yeah. but yeah. But I ended up I ended up leaving Chicago. So then I went on to, to test a you don't know Jack from home, which is a party trivia game. I don't know if you've oh, heard yes. of that, but yeah. yes. But that's been a long time too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, can you still do the Onaga voice by chance? Well, that was modulated a little bit. Um, yeah. What okay. does it sound like? Minus See, the modulation. Say no kicking. <laughs> <laughs> no more kicking. Stop with the kicking. <laughs> it was like that. And the rest yeah. of it was all like guttural roars and yells and that kind of thing. I'd like to see Onaga come back, honestly. Yeah. That that's I'm an would look amazing character. Character. With, with the scaly skin and yeah, yeah. He, he was a lot of bosses kind of um, after a while, bosses kind of feel a bit um, generic, whereas he was he really stood out and everyone was like, whoa, who's this dude? Yeah. You know, he really had a lot of presence. He was yeah. actually my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he was, and he had a massive presence, just a massive the, the scale yeah. of him. It was um, right after MK9 came out, they, there's a place in Elmhurst, Illinois, called the Galloping Ghost. Yes. And yes. you go there. You know, you, okay, you, okay for me, pay, there, 20, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> pay 20 bucks and get to play. And they had a cabinet set up with MK9 in it. And there was this kid, probably 13 years old, playing it, couldn't get past Shang, uh, uh, Shao Kahn at the end. And as we all know, Shao Kahn is kind of a difficult boss to beat. Cheap. Cheap. Okay. I, I didn't want to say it, but he's playing it and he's just getting it handed to him. And he finally, he turns to me and again, I'm with my friend, Carl, who was the one who told me about the game up in the lobby. And he goes, can you beat this guy for me? And I was like, and I've been testing it for like three months. I said, you bet I can. And I took my jacket off and I was wearing that shirt that you're wearing, Christopher, the, the torn okay. out heart shirt. Yeah. So the kid sees I'm wearing an MK shirt. So the secret to beating Shao Kahn, as anybody knows, is you let him walk all over you twice, and then the third time he's he's a pussycat. Yep. Yep. He's, he, there's there's a, that rubber that rubber band difficulty. And while I'm playing it, uh, I hear a ringtone. It's the Halloween theme, and that's my ringtone. So I go to grab my phone, and it's not my phone. It's this little kid's. And I was like, I was like, I was like are you me? In the, am I am I you in the future? What's going on here? But that was fun. But yeah, I mean, bosses like Shao Kahn, I mean, yeah, cheap, um, frustrating <laughs> a little bit, but I would love to see Onaga come back. I would love to see Motaro come back. Yes. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, or a new boss. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what yeah. they have planned. Yeah. Um, I, in a few of the trading cards that you were in, um, I did see you sort of, you know, screaming your heart out into the mic too surely that was a bunch of fun and there's also some clips of you uh, i believe you say shujinku win, uh, wins in one of them did you do the yeah. announcer at all 
I did. I uh, they recorded all of it. They recorded all of the the uh, match of or fight snippets, like round one, round two, finish him, um, all of that. And I recorded all of that in Onaga's voice, so it was modulated oh. as Onaga. But then ultimately, it wasn't used. I don't know if it was uh, who actually got the, the 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 job of recording them, having them put in the game. But ultimately, it wasn't me. And yeah. Uh, yeah, that that trading card where everybody's screaming. Um, there's if you watch carefully, there's a guy who's screaming, and it looks like he's carrying a waste paper basket in his arm. That guy's name was Jared, and Jared couldn't scream with that guttural scream without gagging. <laughs> so he literally is holding a garbage can in case he throws up <laughs> while he's while he's screaming. And uh, there's also Johanna Ananuevo, who was amazing. She was the voice, I believe, of uh, Melina in a few games. And she was just a classic. She has such a great scream to her. And Bess Mikowski, all of those are in the trading card. But the sound guys that did that was Chase Ash, Chase Ashbaker, Jim Bonney. Um, oh, I feel really bad. I'm forgetting somebody's name there. Brian, oh, can't remember Brian's last name. Really good guy. But they were just so much fun to work with. So much fun to work with. And you know, they, they did direction, but they also gave us kind of carte blanche to do what we wanted to do. It was just screaming. <laughs> just for the most well, part. would have made it more, you know, when they were recording Borecho's vomit, then where's that puking guy? <laughs> <laughs> I think that was that was definitely uh, Herman Sanchez. Because yeah. Herman Sanchez uh, created that character. Because, I mean, obviously, Herman uh, is, uh, he's uh, Latino. And Baracho obviously means drunk in Spanish. Yes. <laughs> so he created that that creature, like a, that that character, like a drunken master. And then you had yep. Paime, like a and you know wise old master. So yeah. Oh, Very nice. Yeah. So Mortal Kombat Deception's conquest mode is easily our favorite mode across every Mortal Kombat title. Today. Really? Yes. Oh yes, hundred <laughs> so, <laughs> percent. Wow, that's nice to Still. hear. That's wow. Yeah, and I and spent so many hours doing that. <laughs> playing with that. <laughs> I oh. wanted to know every single secret. Yep. I was playing that religiously for I couldn't even tell you how long. It was did one of find, the greatest times. Did you find Liu Kang? Is that oh, one yeah. he's in Edenia? I think as a. That, that's the one where it, you only have like like a two minute window to find him behind a shed <laughs> somewhere at a certain time. Yep. That was the only way to get him. I was like, I I, I honestly I was like I. I was like, Who, who's doing this that has the patience to do this? Because it all seems kind of mean to me. It seems kind of cruel <laughs> to, to make it this hard to unlock things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Some of the secrets in there, like uh, you have to be very lucky to find Mataro at a certain time in Earthrealm and you can find him. There was a rumor going across the message boards that apparently uh, you could find the female chameleon character in Adenia at a very certain time. I spent so much of my life trying to find her. <laughs> I never found her. And if you think of it, she's one of the only characters you can't find in the game. Yeah. Nobody's yeah. ever found her, so. I, if Shujinko ever did come back in a future game, I would definitely want a mode like that. Because it yes. would be so you would be so overpowered if you started the game with all the powers you can collect during Deception's conquest mode. Because I mean, that's how you get the spear, the the Ice ball, all those special yeah. powers, you have to gain them and collect them. And yes. if Shukinko just shows up with all that knowledge, he's, he's just going to be, maybe he'll be the next boss. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, <But> maybe. <laughs> didn't Ca Cassie Cage killed him, though, in, was it X or 11? In her ending, she ends up killing Shujinko. I think. Yeah, she kills him because she, mis she mistakes him for Shang Tsung. Right. Because they look so yes. similar, and she ends up killing him. And I, no. and I played the game and I got all the endings and I got that ending. And I was like, well, I guess I'm not coming back for that. <laughs> but it's Mortal, it's Mortal Kombat. Who, anybody can come back. Ever. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That and, and a lot of the endings are like what if endings too, right? So Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. not canon. The endings are, are usually not regarded as canon. But Now, now considering Shujinko uh, was Deception's main protagonist, did you have any influence or input into the game's overall story or... Were there any side quests or anything like that that uh, was put forward? You know what? I didn't. I was just always so in awe of the story and how intricate and precise and committed those guys were to the stories. I never had the I was never, you know, 
pompous enough to think, well, my ideas are going to be helpful to them. I just, you know what? I'm a, I'm a dancing monkey. Just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. <laughs> there was there was one instance though where I refused to say a piece of dialogue. Oh. And and uh, it was in regards to one of the kamidogu being cursed. And the line was the kamidogu um, was cursed with an evil taint. And I was not going to say evil taint on this game and make every 12 year old kid laugh. Cause I don't know if that word means the same thing in Canada or Australia, but it's no. No, okay. maybe not. Uh, uh, well, then I won't explain it. It's, it's a strictly American <laughs> thing. And a t the, word, the word taint is not something you would say in polite company. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, I, so, I, so I said, guys, I'm not going to say this. And they were like, no, we know. We know. We'll, we'll figure something out. Because they knew, too, that it was a <laughs> yeah. kind of a, a loaded line. Brian Chard. Br Brian Chard. Chard, was the, yes. the soundproof. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I can't believe it. Nicest guy. Nice. And, of course, Dan Forden was there as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. from time to time, legend. Yeah, yeah. But no, I never, I never, uh, I never deigned to to give my two cents. Really, I mean, I was just so happy to be doing it, just mm. so 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 thrilled and so honored that they'd ask me to do that. How long did it take to do, for you to do all your lines, roughly? Um, I would say probably altogether, maybe two weeks doing the initial readings and going back in for rereads and things like that. And the, oh, it, it took place over, you know, a month and a half. And I had my other stuff I was doing uh, in testing. Um, but yeah, it was it was a pretty it was a pretty thorough, lengthy process. Mm -hmm. But they wanted to, they wanted to get it right. They were they were real sticklers about it, and that was in a good way, in a good way. Because I, I think you know the end product. If if I mean if you guys are any indication that. You know, it is beloved and it's lovely to hear oh. that it really is. It's my favorite Mortal Kombat game to this Me day. Too. Just Me the still deception is. as a whole or just the uh, the conquest mode? As a whole. As a whole. But the conquest, it plays a huge part. But honestly, um, the atmosphere was on point in that game. I thought the writing was so beautiful. Mm. Uh, the mechanics worked well. The, the roster music. was pretty cool. Music. Um, but what I also loved about the, the 3D era and especially deception, though, was not only did you have conquest mode, but you had these incredibly addicting side games like puzzle combat and chess puzzle combat. Game. Those yeah. need to come back. They really that do. would be great. <laughs> even even I mean, people really enjoyed cart combat too. In uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mortal combat. Is that Armageddon? Is that Deception or Armageddon? Armageddon. 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 Okay. Yeah, Armageddon's a little blurry for me because that was when I was in between departments and, and whatnot. Uh, we didn't really have to test that an awful lot. And and uh, I love playing Mortal Kombat for the fatalities. I, that's, <laughs> that's, and, and Armageddon kind of had the dial of fatality thing, which was kind yeah. of off-putting a little bit. But yeah. I understand with that many characters, you got to go yeah. with a system like that rather than try to... <laughs> can you imagine coming up with two signature fatalities for every character that's ever been in a Mortal Kombat game? That's oh That's daunting. God. That's daunting. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. Um, so I believe Shujinko literally means protagonist in Japanese. <laughs> and at yeah. one point, Ed Boon in one of those training card videos described him as kind of a next generation Liu Kang. Um, were right. there any, ever any actual plans to replace Liu Kang with Shujinko had the reception been a little nicer? I would imagine that was going to be the path going forward. Because um, I think, you know, after a while, after that many games, you know, Scorpion is Ed's favorite, and he's never made any secrets about that. But doing no. the same characters over and over again, it's got to get a little tiresome. And yeah, maybe try to inject some new blood. But the reception to Liu Kang being killed at the beginning of uh, Deadly Alliance was uh, was not necessarily good. Um, people were not happy with that. And that's why, you know, he came back so quickly. Um, and I guess I... I the The... the Feedback that I got about Shujinko was that people at the time, I mean, people on the team were telling me that the character Shujinko was not well received. But then looking at, I mean, I've gone on YouTube a few times and there's like little tributes to Shujinko and I'll mention, hey, I, I did the voice. And first it's met with complete disbelief <laughs> to the point to the point where I have to send a link to the trading card on YouTube. And then once they believe it, they gush about it. They really they really like Shujinko. And. I thought he was a good character as well. Yeah. And I think it would have been 
awesome for him to move on as the main protagonist and to maybe train, become a trainer for the next new prota uh, protagonist. Something like that. I think that would have worked really well. But, you know, it's, it's the Mortal Kombat universe. Anything can be revisited. Anything can be done. So mm -hmm. that, that's the... Uh, that's the I love the whole story around the Kamidogu. I love his journey and I love that he was de um, deceived at the end. And yeah. you know, to me, I always feel like Shujinko is a character that could go either way. And there's so much potential for his storyline, especially now that he's been gone for so long. If they brought him back, they could literally do anything with him. Yeah. And it would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But it has to have, he has to have your voice. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> well now, that they're or now that they're owned by Warner Brothers, um, I'm not a SAG actor on a Screen Actors Guild actor and Warner Brothers uh, insists on that. And that's why in Mortal Kombat versus DC Universe, um, it's me, Shang Tsung, making the fight noises and the pain reaction noises. But it's uh, it's an actual SAG card holding actor who is doing the actual uh, lines. So I would as much as I'd love to come back, um, I, I would have to get my SAG card first. But um it's a dream. So, it's a dream. <laughs> Let this be your audition. <laughs> yeah, Can you still okay. do the voice? Yeah, so, oh, yeah. It was not by chance that this struggle oh. came to be. The blame <laughs> falls squarely upon my shoulders. But oh, what's fun is me back iconic to a good lines. <laughs> so yeah. good. I haven't, I haven't done it in a while. Um, <laughs> but it's funny though, as you play through Conquest, you'll notice that Shujinko has no discernible accent whatsoever when he's a child and a teenager. And it's not until he becomes an old man that he suddenly has yeah. the accent. <laughs> but that, that wasn't my choice. I think that I think the overall choice in that was they really wanted because you'll admit that in Conquest the dialogue's a little stilted. But I think they wanted to go for that uh, dubbed over Run Run Shaw kind of uh, English dubbing, that feel for it. Because that's that's what I think they were going for. And I think that's what they, they achieved. There were times where I was like, you sure you want me to say this like this? And they're like, yeah. That's, so I think that's what they were going for. But then I just thought it was always funny that Shujinko turned 35 and said, I'm going to give myself an accent. <laughs> <laughs> just, just decided talking like an old wise uh, instructor. But, yeah. You know. Again, Mortal Kombat, you, you learn to suspend a little disbelief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, yeah. So, Max, out of all the moments in Conquest, did you have a personal favorite? In Conquest? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, honestly, I, I, I loved the... Uh, well, there's the one line that I love. It's not even one of my lines. It's the guard at the bridge that says, I love ham. <laughs> um, that's that's one of my favorite moments, <laughs> and you have to go. You have to go catch, uh, fetch him a ham so you can cross the bridge. But I really, I love the, I love the ending in the sense that when Shujinko finally realizes that it's just, that it's all been a ruse by Onaga to gain mm. his freedom. I mean, the guy has literally spent his entire life yes. making a mistake. Yeah. Everything he's done, that he's done correctly, was done for the wrong reason. And I think yep. that's a really, really heavy message to put in a fighting oh, yeah. game. You know, I mean, that's that's a that's a yeah. life wasted mm. a life, not only wasted, but in the service to the detriment of everybody else on the planet. That's that's, that's a heavy load to carry. Yeah. And I, I love that the, uh, that that's where the story went. I think that was I mean, I know that lots of people worked on the story, but that's uh, John Vogel is the uh, is the lore master. Mm. His, his his title at mid at Neverome is lore master, and I would imagine I'm not like 100 percent sure, but I think all of those story beats were probably of his design. So mm. it's pretty admirable. I would love to see I would love to see a movie or a series that sticks that close to that sticks close to this narrative. I think it would be amazing. Tell me about amazing. it. Yeah. yeah, and that's that was the whole. Um the whole reason I started Kamidogu as a website, I love the concept of the Kamidogu. And I spent, at the time I was between jobs for a while and I needed to fill time. So I spent months and months putting together what I believe is the biggest conquest guide on oh, the internet. Cool. And yes. where is it? Uh, it's on our website, uh, kamidogu.com. Oh, okay. okay. um, but man, I, I spent so much time in there and yeah, going over the story, multiple times and even looking back now i don't think any mortal kombat game storyline has come close i think it was just the nope. perfect the perfect storyline love it i couldn't agree love more yeah. yeah yeah and seeing it you know on the big screen would be awesome if i ever went that uh, way 
If they went if they went that way, I would rather see it as like an eight part miniseries. Yeah. Like something like yes. that. Something on HBO or something like mm-hmm. that. So you could stay true to the dark feel of it and the violence yes. of it, but still I mean it's what, like what they're doing right now with uh, The Last of Us. Oh, they're yes. taking a game. They're taking a game story, staying relatively faithful to it, embellishing where they can to make it more, you know, relatable and accessible for everybody. People didn't yep. play the game, but you could, if you could do that with Mortal Kombat, I mean, my wife and I watched the last movie that came out, and if you didn't play Mortal Kombat, a lot of that movie wouldn't have made any sense to you. Yeah, because I, I think at yeah. the end is when Sub Zero says for the Lin Kuei, and I don't think he's mentioned anywhere else in the movie. That he's a member of the Lin Kuei or what the Lin Kuei are. So at the end of it, my wife was like, who's Lin Kuei? Like she's <laughs> like she's a receptionist. This is Lin Kuei, my receptionist. But, um, but yeah, I would love to take take the time, tell these stories, because it is mm-hmm. such a, a yeah. rich universe. Mm-hmm. Um, and most importantly, Outworld needs to be purple. <laughs> yes, like, of course. Like today, like the no. old days, it needs to be purple. Yeah. That's Outworld. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so, with regards to Onaga himself, um, mm-hmm. what was it like voicing such a huge character? And how did that process kind of differ to Shijinko? Because I guess you had to kind of, I know they modified your voice, but did you have to kind of like take on a new stance and, you know, really yeah. push hard to get that out? Yeah, you know what? It was odd because as Shujinko, I just kind of like, at certain ages, I would find myself when I was doing the old Shujinko, I would kind of hunch over. But with <laughs> Onaga, with Onaga, I had my chest out and I was like, oh, like bellowing into the microphone. And uh, and that took a toll after a while, but it was so much fun. It was so much fun. Because at, at the time, um, when I did Shujinko, I don't think they had Shujinko. I wasn't watching Shujinko's model. But they had Onaga and I was like, okay, I'm going to have to go. I'm going to dig deep for this guy because he's a half man, half dragon. And, uh, and yeah, you puff out, you put your arms to your side and yeah, stop with the kicking. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it was great. I was, and to play Shang Tsung, Onaga and Shujinko in that game was just, was just amazing. I can't believe being Onaga slipped my mind until just a few <laughs> months ago. And I was like, oh yeah, I did that too. I yeah. did that too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm hoping you can shed a bit of light on this. It's kind of an interesting question. Okay. There's a supposed unreleased ending on YouTube for Onaga, which is a bit strange because generally to get to the endings, you need to finish the arcade ladder, but you can't play as Onaga. So my question to you is, hmm. do you know anything about that? And do you recall, because clearly Shujinko narrates all of the endings, but in this particular one, Onaga narrates it himself. Is that something you remember recording or is it just a uh, really, really good fake? I do not remember recording an ending for Onaga and I don't ever remember any talk of him being a playable character in Deception. He's not a playable mm. character in Deception, no. is he? No, no, he's only an only an Armageddon. Yeah. But um no, I don't think there was ever any plan for him to become a playable character. And I don't I don't recall doing a reading okay. for an ending. But again, that was two thousand two, four, four you're saying, so yeah. Four. Yeah. eighteen years ago. But I I think my memory is good enough that I would remember recording an ending yeah. for Onagi. If if that's if that's the case, I mean, they wouldn't have created an ending unless there were plans to make him mm. a playable character. I mean, other than that, when would his ending have played if he defeated yeah. somebody at the end of the ladder? Yeah. But no other no other boss has gotten that kind of treatment. You never see an ending for Shao Kahn or or uh, or Shang Su- Shang Tsung and even Quan Chi and Shang Tsung and Deadly Alliance. They don't get an ending if they beat you at the end of the ladder. Mm. So that's interesting. I, I, I this is the first time I've ever heard that. So I will have to look yeah. into that. Yeah. Yeah, those images are very interesting for sure. Are there real other images? Hmm. Yeah, yep. there's images there's too. There's actual images? There's no yep. subtitles like the um, other endings. Um, I believe it's 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 put up as like an unreleased concept ending. So perhaps it wasn't finished or maybe, like I said, maybe it's fan made. Um, but it sounds quite convincing. No. And it, um, the storyline's really cool because I believe he takes everything and becomes the one being. So it's he attains ultimate power. Really? So, it's really cool, yeah. I like huh. it. Even if it's a fan one, I love it. Yeah, it's been a while, but from what I can recall, I'm pretty sure in the crypt you can unlock that concept art and you view it in the content section, so. Okay. Yeah. No way. Okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe it is fan-made. I'm not sure. But, yeah, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> well, but, I mean, just, just knowing 
the the uh, the the depths that the fans will go mm. for this for these games it, it wouldn't surprise me if there was a fan main ending out there um, <laughs> yeah and i think and even yet- recently ed boone admitted that deception is his favorite 3d era game oh so really off the back of that i hope we get some deception love in mortal kombat 12 <laughs> oh that'd be great that would be great uh, yeah yeah uh, Max, I got an interesting question for you. Do you have sure. any uh, recollection of uh, particular scenes or dialogue that ended up being omitted from the final game? Not that I know of. Um, I'm thinking okay. of it. I, I've, I played all the way through Conquest, of course. I didn't get it. I didn't get all the the, the the rewards, but I played through the whole thing, and I don't believe there was anything that I can recall of note being omitted. From the game itself, there might have, there may have been storylines that were omitted, but they didn't involve me. Oh, okay. So I mean, because uh, I'm, I'm, I think you meet everybody during conquest mode. I don't think, I don't think anybody's left out. I think you except can, for the female chameleon. Chameleon, yeah, the female <laughs> chameleon. But everybody else gets to, gets their the fifteen chameleon? minutes of fame in conquest. Is what male? Pretty chameleon? much. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can even find meat. You can even find meat in the nether. You can even find meat. <laughs> yes. You can even, and I'm also, I, I this, this is a lot of just fan talk that I'm hearing right now, but I'm also kind of psyched that so many people want to see Havoc again. Mm. Oh, I would love He's to see He's who Havoc I want to see most. He was yeah, so bad. I, I think the whole concept love- of Chaos Realm is super exciting. And he was, he was really unique because I think he was actually yeah. meant to be, was in Noob originally. That was yeah. the artwork for Noob. And then he became oh, yeah, his own yeah, character. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but he was. Yeah, I'm I'm on that bandwagon. Definitely. Yeah, he's, he's and if you if you read the comics and the like the other stuff, Havoc's a big part of yeah. these stories. He's got a big influence over a lot of the goings yes. on in the comic books, from what I understand. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. I would I would also like to see somebody go 180 degrees and bring back Sue Howe <laughs> and 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 make him and make him a make him top tier. Make like fix everything about Sue Howe right. that everybody hates. And I remember when I saw the character of Sue Howe in the concept drawings. I think John Vogel designed Sue Howe, and he had that big thing on his chest. And I suggested, uh, you know what? Uh, maybe he's a member of another clan, and he survived Kano's heart rip, and mm. that's why he's here. He's kind of to get revenge on Kano, and that didn't get used. So <laughs> that's probably why probably why I didn't make any suggestions for deception. <laughs> Personally, I don't get the hate for Suho. I don't. He's ah. he's not the greatest, but he's certainly not the worst. Oh, definitely. And they proved in Armageddon that Striker could be cool, so it, yeah. it can be done. It can be done. Yeah, it can be done. I mean, as as far as uh, D- Deadly Alliance, I think Suho is a little better than uh, Mavaldo. Oh, Mavaldo. Yeah. Yeah. I Mavado. found Mavado Mavado. a little. Yeah, he was he was a cool character, but I found him a little bit a little bit boring. Hmm. Yeah, I was much more intrigued with uh, Dagon in Armageddon in terms yes, of the Red Dragon. Cool. He was badass. Yeah. Dagon. Yeah. The two uh, brothers. Oh, Tavin's t- 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 yeah. brother. The brothers. Dagon, yeah. The brothers. Yes. Sorry. Yep. Took me a second. <laughs> that was a pre- that was a pre- that was a pretty good conquest mode too. Yeah, I enjoyed I that one too. I enjoyed yeah. that conquest mode too, but it certainly wasn't as lengthy or as in depth as yeah. Deception's <laughs> conquest mode. No. Yeah. They, that, that, the conquest mode for Deception, I think, could have been a full price title on its own. Hmm. Yeah. It's unreal. Yeah. I mean, I've said this yeah. in other podcasts, but my dream would be for them to create like a conquest mode that is alive, like a live world. And, yeah. you know, during during the weeks um, as, as they pass, they can add new content. You know, weather can change and areas can change mm. and it can be something that can live on for years. And I think the fans would absolutely love that. It would be like deception on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> like like an, like an open world. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. yeah that would be, and, and I do believe that... that from time to time, I would hear rumblings about that at Midway, because uh, Midway didn't didn't develop, but they did publish uh, the Lord of the Rings online. So they had a resource if they wanted to to maybe make a deal to do an open world Mortal Kombat game. That would have been amazing. Oh yeah, you yeah. know, I mean, I like encounter people and then have it have the whole world flip to a two and a half D and then. The fight and then flip back. I mean, it'd be very cool. <laughs> yeah. Hey, never say never, though. I guess, right? But no, nah, they will continue to make Mortal Kombat games until I don't know when. <laughs> because I mean, as far as I, I'm concerned, I mean, I loved MKX, but 
I loved MKX a little more than MK11, but I still love MK11. Um, I love the story modes. I, I love the story modes. Um, mm. But yeah, just I just think they need to switch it up a little bit. In my mm. opinion. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah, it does. It does get a little samey after a while, but but um, it's always just. I just love the fatalities. I love the fatalities. Yeah. I love the new fatalities, and every time a new one comes out, and this last one with all the brutalities and mm. lots of fun stuff. Except in there. I kind of don't like how the brutalities are hidden. Like you can't oh, just yeah. go to a website, find a move list, and do them. It's kind of like, oh, I, I found a secret. Someone found a secret one, but you know, it, there's there's so many out there, and it's like we'll find them. I don't I don't like that in a way. I, I kind of like you know fatalities. They're listed. You know how to do them. Um, right. The brutalities are cool, but I'd like to, at least a few years after the game, now that the game, you know, MK11's, what, three to four years old now, I'd like them to just, okay, here's a full list of how to do everything. Go have fun. You know? Is is that not something, is that not a resource that's available? No. I didn't realize that. I think they're still discovering, uh, YouTubers are still discovering new brutalities, which is cool in a way, but at the same time, like, the game's old now, Let's let's have fun with it, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of great people that have worked on these Mortal Kombat games, of course. Uh, could you tell us any particular uh, stories or great experiences you've had working with some of the people on Deception? Oh, God. Almost ev- every every experience pretty much working for the Mortal Co- the MK team at, at Midway and at Netherrealm was... Yeah, it was one of those things, man. I mean... Here I am, obsessed with this game when it comes out in the early 90s, and then I moved to Chicago, and all of a sudden, I'm working for the company that makes the game. I'm seeing Ed Boone and Dan Forden just walking around the cafeteria, and it's like, I was starstruck. <laughs> I was absolutely starstruck. I, was, I remember the first time I saw Dan, I was like, oh my god, that's Toasty. That's the Toasty <laughs> guy. And, and of course, uh, I had friends in Chicago that I'd gone to, to college with, uh, that were just absolutely over the moon that I was working for Midway and they were big Mortal Kombat fans too. But I mean, uh, Chase Ashbaker, one of the guys, the sound guys that recorded the dialogue for Deception. I was on a bowling league with him and it oh, was wow. great. I mean, he's, I, we've not talked in a while because, you know, everything after Midway shut down fell apart. Um, but yeah, Chase is one of the best friends I had. Everybody in marketing for from Midway was great. They were on a couple of gals from there were on the same bowling league. Um, uh, just to, just in general, just it was really hard not to be happy at Midway. Even even if the work was, you know, sometimes drudgery, sometimes things, you know, you'd get crazy requests from people who didn't understand how things worked. We weren't in a mine. We weren't like a mile deep in the earth mining coal. We were making fun <laughs> games for people. And you t- if, you, if people asked where you worked and you said, oh, Midway Games, they knew exactly what you were talking about. Um, but individually, yeah, I mean, Rigo, Rigo Cortez. I had a great time with going to lunch ah. with Rigo. And we were in the same department for many, many years. We did a lot of... And this was something... And I don't want to besmirch any game in particular. But... Several Gauntlet games. Do you remember Gauntlet? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, Elf, Elf, Elf shot the food and yeah, all that. Um, you'd have to get four-player Gauntlet footage. And nobody wanted to play Gauntlet. <laughs> nobody <laughs> wanted to sit with me for an hour or two hours. Like three other people would have to sit there and play the game so we could chop it up and put it into commercials and promotional materials. And nobody would want to do that. But for a lot of games like Rampage and Mortal Kombat, it was usually Rigo sitting by my side getting that footage with me. He was, he was probably on that footage that was shown in 40 year old virgin as well. But yeah. Rigo and I were shoulder to shoulder on a lot of things in at midway. Yeah. Did at you midway. go um, to art of pizza on your lunch breaks? Which one? <laughs> art of pizza. Out of pizza. Art. Art of, oh, art of pizza. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on, over on Ashland. It's the accent. It's the accent. No, it's okay. It's okay. It just, just took me a second. Yeah. Over on Ashland art of pizza. Yeah. Art of pizza was fantastic. Um, uh, there was, uh, Krabby's, it was Krabby's Crab Shack or something like that over on, <laughs> on Western that, and I'm sure they're not there now, but we used to go there and cause, cause, cause the, um, cause there would be like, like, uh, provocatively clad waitresses and that sort of thing. <laughs> but, um, it was always, it was always fun 
being like the oldest guy on, on a testing team. And I hear, I hear people say, oh, I'm old school, man. I was raised on the N64. And I'd be like, oh, you sweet summer child. <laughs> you sweet summer child. <laughs> you know, the N64. I was a sophomore in college when that came out. <laughs> yep. Um, oh, no, me, probably even older than that. But it, that, that, was, that was always fun. Um, and like I said, I, I always felt like I, uh, I was born at exactly the right time to be a video game fan because... From the ages of one to five, we had nothing. And then we got Pong. And then we got Atari. <laughs> and Cole yep. ColecoVision was the first thing I ever saved up for as a kid on my allowance. And then just from there and just saying over and over again, it can't get any better than this. And then the next generation would come out and be like, oh my God, it can't get better than this. And and ultimately, we, here we are now. And I don't even say it anymore because it just keeps getting better. Yeah. And now <laughs> Un Unreal, Unreal Engine 5 coming out. Yeah. Mm, see what that can do. See what that can Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Indeed. I, I hope I never age out of it. I just hope I never age out of it. That's it. Young at heart. <laughs> and I have I have a lovely, lovely wife that uh this whole room down here is gaming. It's, I've got a giant TV, I've got my consoles here. I got, she got me a Oculus Quest 2 last year for oh, nice. Christmas. And she suggested that this room be dedicated to that. I've even got a little <laughs> fridge here. She, she suggested getting this little mini fridge here so I don't, you know, have to go upstairs to get beers because she's afraid I'm going to fall down the stairs. <laughs> yeah, she, she's awesome. You, you scored a good one. I definitely <laughs> did. I definitely <laughs> did. I'm, I'm a very, very lucky man. For wow. sure. Absolutely. For sure. Um, I believe you're a huge fan of horror. I can see, I believe it says the Texas Chainsaw Massacre behind you. And that's a, yes. uh, is that a Michael Myers mask uh, behind you as well? It is a Michael Myers mask. Very that, nice. Uh, yes. that, tex that Texas Chainsaw Massacre poster is an original, well, an original, a print of an original done by uh, a company that had, it, it, this was never used as an actual poster for the movie, but they they do custom posters for all kinds of movies, and the artwork is absolutely amazing. And I got that at a at a a, a horror con in Connecticut. But yeah, nice. huge horror fan. What did I watch the other night? Oh, Knock at the Cabin. I watched Knock at the Cabin. The oh, other I'm gonna night. watch that tonight. <laughs> uh, uh oh, sounds uh, not so good. Just, <laughs> I see what was attempted, but it just yeah. comes. It's just, uh, opinions vary. It was a little. It was a little flat. Look, let's just say. M. Night Shyamalan, if I pronounced that correctly, mm -hmm. he's made some legendary films, but uh, he's made some flops. Some, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For, uh, no, every for, yeah. Say, for, for every six cents, there's uh, The Happening, <laughs> which is The Happening is one of the worst movies I've ever seen with a big yes. budget. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I got a question for you. I'm also a big horror fan and I'm a diehard Michael Myers fan. I'm having a hard time seeing what uh, edition of the mass is that behind you. Is that uh, the curse? Oh, uh, no, that's the 2018. That's oh, the, nice. Yeah, that's the 2018, 2018 version. Yeah. Yeah. Did you yeah. did you like uh, David Gordon Green's uh, versions? You know what? I'm I think I'm one of like eight people in the country that didn't mind Halloween ends. I didn't mind. They did something mind. different. They didn't. They, they did something different. They tried something new. And I mean, yeah. I, I was a little put off by the end of Halloween Kills. It's like, oh my God, come on. Because <laughs> now, now, now he is supernatural. He obviously is supernatural. He took a beating like that. He got spoilers. He got up and he took the whole town out. And I was like, no, what, what? but at the, at the beginning of the new, the last one, he's, he's hurt. He's hurt yeah. bad. All, all of his, all of his power is almost gone. And he's got to pass it on to somebody else. It's like, that's fresh. That's a fresh idea. It's not just yeah. him running around killing people. He's not Jason. I like to think he's a little yeah. classier than Jason, if that's the right word for it. 100%. But um, I, I, at the end of Halloween Ends, what ultimately happened to him? I was like, I the whole time I was waiting for him. I was like, okay, okay. And I said, like, oh, all right then. Then okay, wow. And I, I admired that. Yeah, I, I thought uh, it was an interesting direction. I, I think um, some people hate on it a bit too much there. But I mean, come on, honestly. You compare that to like Rob Zombie's versions, and literally in Halloween too, he's a Jason Voorhees, and oh, it was awful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, did it was bad. I mean, it didn't, it didn't. Well, that's just another instance of explaining explaining your antagonist is the worst thing you can do. 
I mean, oh, Michael Myers came from a hillbilly family where there's an abused stepdad. No, he didn't. He was just, he was just evil. He just, <laughs> yeah. six years old, decided, yeah, today's the day I'm going to kill my sister. Never yeah. said another word. Yeah, yep. but, I mean, that's, that's scary. Yep, but, you said it right. So, I mean, not to hijack, but what did you guys think of the last Mortal Kombat movie? Uh, to be dead honest, um, I enjoyed it. Uh, I think it definitely has its share of flaws. Uh, I think there's a lot that could be improved. Uh, some of their decisions, I I I, I really didn't like. Uh, I think they kind of like Reiko. A uh, ham, like uh, they kind of. <laughs> what'd you say? Like Reiko. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> was there no director? On, was there was Come there on. no director on set that do, day? Do the impersonation. <laughs> do the impersonation, Toasty. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I hope that didn't kill everybody's ears, man. <laughs> well done, well done. Oh, thank that's you, thank right, you. It's right on the. Is that, I think is that guy a professional wrestler? I think so. Because that's what he was acting like. That's what he was acting like. That was not Reiko. I'm I'm sorry, but he didn't look like Reiko. He didn't act like Reiko. No, no. Some, yeah. some parts of the movie were awesome, like the introduction scene. Man, that oh, was, the first that was incredible. That was yeah. so good. Yeah. Yes. That was, but, yeah. that was very impressive. Some some sections were a little questionable. And um, Lewis Tan did an awesome job, but I'm wondering where they're going to go with the whole Cole storyline, because uh, that was sort of left field out of nowhere. That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't need a manufactured protagonist like mm. that. It reminded me of Art Lean in the first Mortal Kombat movie, the guy who who was just like, oh, Justice we, we can art. we we can kill this guy because he's not in the game, and that's the only reason he was in the movie was to get killed. <laughs> yeah, because they had to have a fat had that fatality. Shijinko guess, for MK two. That'd be great. Hey, <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. Um. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing uh, currently, Max. Uh, are you working on any particular projects? Um, I haven't done software testing in... Uh, I left Chicago in 2012, moved back to Connecticut for a while, and that's when my wife and I got married. She was living in Chicago. She moved to Connecticut, and we got married in Connecticut. Then we moved from Connecticut to a little town up here in the northwest corner of Illinois called Galena. It's right on the it's on the border of Wisconsin and Iowa, and okay. it's a tour it's a tourist town, um, absolutely gorgeous. So I, we showed up here. I'd never seen it before. I took one look at downtown and I said, "How quick can we move?" And that was at the end of November 2016, and we closed on our house January of 2017. So the two months later. Oh wow! And uh, and I am now uh, I do ghost tours. Oh wow! Yeah, I'm a ghost tour guide here in Galena. Galena has a long history. It's a it's a, it's a, it's a, call, it's a a lead mining town. There's lots of ghost stories here. So, hey, Chris, do you have an interest in the look, paranormal, or because we're oh, yeah. hugely we're hugely into that stuff? We're, looks like we're gonna have another <laughs> yeah. podcast soon. That'd be great. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, because they're. I mean, if you if you talk if you talk to the business owners on Main Street here, they will and ask them, "Has anything? Have you experienced anything strange here?" I would say probably seventy to seventy five percent will tell you has have a story for you. Wow. wow. Yeah. That's yeah, because cool. back in back in the eighteen, it was founded in eighteen twenty six. But back in the eighteen hundreds, downtown was about two thirds of the length it is now. But it was home to over sixty bars and saloons. So all there was <laughs> Shit. all there was to do was drink and get in trouble. So people would die in the streets <laughs> on a pretty break. There was no law. It was like it was like Deadwood. It was it wow. was nuts. So so yeah, I do an hour and a half tour. Um, in the, in the warm weather, starting in April, ending at the end of October, uh, for the uh, Haunted Galena Tour Company, and it's just wow. great. I went on, I went on the tour uh, first. I didn't try to get the job, but I went on the tour. And I was like, oh my god, this is fascinating, fantastic. And I asked because the guy who owns the company is my friend, and I was like, if you ever need an extra set of legs and lungs to do this, I'd be happy to. And he was like, we've been trying to figure out how to ask you. And I was like, great, I'm on board. So that's what I've been doing for the last. This will be my fourth season. Wow. Wicked. That's so before we head to the last segment of the show, I want to sure. ask you one question, Max. Mm -hmm. Uh since we're really interested in this topic right here, do you uh have any particular experience in your life with the paranormal that has really changed you, that has really opened your eyes? Tell us about any of your experiences. Absolutely. Um 
about a month after I started the uh, the first season, um, COVID hit. So we could still do the tours because we were outside. And, uh, and I've always been a believer in not just the paranormal, but like certain amounts of cryptid stuff. Um, yeah. I, I was I was literally raised to believe in Bigfoot. I think it was just my dad messing with me <laughs> for like my formative years. And it wasn't until I got to college that I realized, oh wait, a lot of people don't believe in Bigfoot. No, <laughs> and I was I was surprised by this. But uh, so COVID hit, and so we were able to do the tours, but we could only take ten people at a time, whereas usually we would cap off at thirty. So I would take my group and walk to the east side of town, and then uh, south. And about a month after it started, I felt something looming over my shoulder. Mm. And I thought, and you know how aware we all were during the pandemic of how close people were to us. So yeah, I turned yeah. around thinking a guest had come up to ask me a question. And I turned mm. and my nearest guest is like 10 feet behind me. Oh, shit. And, and this wasn't a one-off. It, was, it started happening, not every time, but like two, three times a month. So it had always happened at the same place right after this restaurant on Main Street uh -huh. is when I would feel it. So after a while, it was, you know, it was distressing and disconcerting. But after a while, it actually became kind of, you know, I dare say annoying. It was like, oh, my God, it happened again. This thing yeah. got me again. And so I came home one night and it, it had happened that night. I came home and told my wife and my wife, dead serious, just went like, dead, like just looked at me uh -huh. and pointed and said, said, don't you dare bring anything home. Ah, uh, yeah. So uh. now, now I walk on the west side of the street. I don't even go on the east side of the street anymore. <laughs> so yeah, I've had, I've had wow. numerous, ex numerous instances of the same experience, which to me adds validity to it for me. Because mm -hmm. even if I was a skeptic, I mean, we all have moments like that where it's like, oh, you, you're, yeah, you see something out of the peripheral, that sort of thing. But this is a genuine feeling of something hovering in the same place happening more than once. So yeah. So and. The, the, the guests on the tour have experiences like that too. There's a ho there's a hotel downtown where I end the tour, and there's a, a bathroom, a women's bathroom on the first floor that's purported to be haunted. And I don't always tell that story. Sometimes, in this case, a kid was getting a little, you know, worked up. He was tired, whatever. So I decided to skip the story about the haunted bathroom. But there was a bachelorette party on the tour that night, and while I was talking to this, some of the, some of the ladies, one of them left to go use the bathroom, and she comes back and she goes is there something wrong with that bathroom? And I hadn't told the story. And I said, why? And apparently she'd been in one of the stalls and one by one, the taps had come on, on the sinks. Oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> so, so when somebody tells me something happened that I actually do already know about, but she doesn't, that's another thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's called yeah. the DeSoto, DeSoto House Hotel. It's Illinois' oldest operating hotel and stories galore in there. Of, of people having experiences in the rooms, in the ballroom, the lady in black that uh, is down in the basement. It's, yeah, Galena's a real haunted town. You should look it up. You should look it up. It's yeah, a lot of interesting do. stories. I will, for sure. Yeah. Do. Cool. Cool. That's great. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're now going to head to the last part of the show, which is okay. called Final Round. So what we're going to do in this final round is sort of ask you some fun questions, get to know you a little more. And so the first question being, what would you say is your all-time favorite video game? All-time favorite video game would probably be um, Resident Evil 2. Ah. Oh, no, 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 I'm way off, way off, way off. Uh, the original Silent Hill. I know Silent Hill 2 is better. Just in every single way, but I don't think Silent Hill gets the love that it deserves for being, yep. for me, the first of that kind of game with the atmosphere and the fog mm -hmm. to cover up the draw-in, but still working so well. as well. I love Silent Hill. I wish, I, I like that Silent Hill's getting a remake, but I think they should, you know, pay some respect to the first game and remake that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Silent well, Hill. Silent Resident, Hill. Capcom have gone nuts with the Resident Evil remakes and they're, I mean, pause. <laughs> Um, everyone's excited for four, but I think they'd be crazy not to do something similar with the classic Silent Hill titles. I know yeah, they are for absolutely. part two, but they, they should do the first one, right? They're, they should they're do the first one. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know how Konami is even working anymore with uh, uh, Hideo Without. Kojima. Hideo, yeah. he, he's no longer with them, I don't think. Uh, and I mean, yeah, there's not much left. 
<laughs> There's not the much left. left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have any guilty pleasures? <laughs> um, guilty pleasures. Uh, I do watch a lot of really bad horror movies. Like I, I, act, <laughs> I active actively seek them out to the point where I mean, they're movies that nobody. I watch these movie, these YouTube videos, like these horror movies you've never heard of, and it's like I heard of all of these, and I can name <laughs> ten that you probably never heard of. Trauma. Trauma, Trauma Entertainment. Out of New Jersey. <laughs> Poultry Guys. Poultry Guys. Night of the Chicken <laughs> Dead. <laughs> God. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So Tro- good. Tromeo and, Tromeo and Juliet. Tro- <laughs> that, that's actually that's actually pretty good. That's a, that's probably one of the better yeah. ones. Yeah. 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 But yeah, Tro- I grew up in Troma because they're, they're out of New Jersey and I grew up in Connecticut. So we oh, had... Yeah. Um, I actually lived in a town when my wife and I first got married. We, we were living in a town called Kent, Connecticut. And Kent, okay. Connecticut is, is known for two things primarily. It was a historical site for one thing. But two things. Uh, one, it's where Seth MacFarlane grew up. Mm. And he went on to make Family Guy. And yep. second, it's where they shot the movie, the 1972 movie, I Spit on Your Grave. Oh, that's gnarly. Yeah. They, they, they like to talk about Seth MacFarlane. They don't like to talk about a spit on your grave in Kent. It's, 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 not, it's not a point of pride with them in Kent, Connecticut to talk about I spit oh. on your grave. Oh, my God. But, yeah, I mean, I, I seek out bad movies all the time. I love them. The, That's the, wicked. The, yeah. The schlockier, the better. <laughs> um, Did you by chance ever have... Any interesting uh, fan encounters? Has anyone ever uh, noticed you or recognized you as Shijinko or? You know what? I got I got the the dragon tattoo. Oh, wow. uh, <laughs> when, I, I, when I first moved here to Galena, and uh, just in passing, I mentioned to the tattooist, I was like, "Yeah, I'm getting this because I used to work for uh, Midway Games in Netherrealm, and I did voices." And they asked, and, and there was a kid, maybe 20 years old. He immediately went to the computer, printed out a picture of me off of Google image search with me and uh, the dragons behind me. It's for the trading card. And he had me autograph and it's still hanging in the tattoo parlor where oh. I got that done. <laughs> so, but, awesome. no, but nobody's really ever, ever recognized me. I do sometimes tell my group uh, before the ghost tour, like if we, if we have about a half an hour waiting for everybody to show up and I engage them in conversation. If they ask what I did, I tell them and I get... People that no way, I'm a, I'm a huge Mortal Kombat fan, that sort of thing. But nobody's ever said or heard my voice at like the McDonald's drive through and going, hey, Shikinko. <laughs> <laughs> that's never, that's never happened. <laughs> what is it? Um, Master Boracho cracked the dojo window. <laughs> Master dojo window. <laughs> uh, um, um, but, 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 uh, like fan stuff you were talking about, you're talking about Mortal Kombat, Mortal Kombat fan stuff, right? Sure. Or yeah. Just because, but I, I did get to my my wife uh, surprised me with tickets to a horror con, the same place I got this poster. Uh, signed me up for a special like uh, VIP breakfast with George Romero. Whoa! Ooh, nice. So and and it wasn't like a big event. There were maybe nine of us in this room with George Romero eating pastries and drinking cocoa and just talking to George Romero about everything. That's the incredible. Living Dead creep show. I mean, Creep Show is one of my favorite movies. I've, I've, but it came out in '80. I was 10 years old. I saw it like five times in the theater at 10 <laughs> years old. I don't know how I pulled that off, but and that was that was just a few months before he passed. So I'm really glad I was able to have that, that moment yeah. with him. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Uh, what are some of your secret talents? Um, secrets. I, I I'm 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 an actor. Uh, I just got done a couple of weeks ago doing a play here in Galena. This is the first play I've done without a script in my hand in probably 25 years. I went to college for, for theater and I, I had every intention of going to Chicago to become an actor, but it's really hard. I mean, it, it, juggling a job and mass transit. And if you don't live in the neighborhood where the theater is, then you're out of luck. So I didn't, I haven't been able to do a whole lot of acting in a while. I was in a band for about 10 or 12 years from college oh. to the first, uh, first five or 10 years that I was in Chicago. And that was a lot of fun. What I style of music? Singer. Um, we had a really eclectic sound. It was a band called Go Ask Brian, and we had seven members. We had two guitarists, a bassist, drummer, and our drummer was our drummer is still a blue man. He's one of the blue men. Um, I was a singer. 
We had a cello and a an accordion. So it was wow. like all kinds of stuff, all originals. I wanted to do some covers, but nobody else was interested in doing covers. Oh. But it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. So I did that for a while. But as far as hidden talents, I can drink an heroic amount of beer. <laughs> I guess, <laughs> <laughs> I guess that, if that's if that's a talent, not not going to serve me for very long. But <laughs> but yeah, I, everything's pretty much on my sleeve. What I can do, what I can't do. <laughs> very nice. Good. Um, aside from those things you've just mentioned, do you have anything else that you would consider a hobby? Um, um, I like to draw. I, uh, hmm. I draw sometimes. I've, I've been trying to write stuff down, like, as far as, like, a, a, a fiction, a prose work of fiction. I've been trying to do that for a long time. Um, but really, I mean, my nights are pretty well regimented, too, because my wife goes to bed at around nine, and I go to bed around three. Because, oh, yeah. because mm. she doesn't like horror, she doesn't like horror movies, and so she goes to bed. And I watch the stuff. But I'm not going to subject her to watching, uh, <laughs> but she she is she's really digging The Last of Us. She loves The Last of Us, but there's so no good. way she so good. But there's no way she would watch something like The Living Dead or The Walking Dead, rather, or anything that's too gory. I'm like, have you guys seen Terrifier with Art no. Art the Clown? No, uh, ter- I've been meaning no. to watch that. I've been meaning yeah, to Terrifier watch. Two, right? I hear it's <laughs> like crazy. Well, Terrifier, Terrifier 2 is ult, ultra gory, but it doesn't really match. It doesn't really uh, live up to the one okay. major set piece kill from the first uh, Terrifier. Okay. But there's no way <laughs> that, that my wife, Stephanie, would watch that. So I watched well, 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock. I play whatever game I'm currently playing, which right now is Red Dead Redemption 2. Nice. Um, yeah. So ch- I, I, I let it sit for wait. My dad, sorry. <laughs> um, sh- 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 he hates Red Dead Redemption. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> yeah, he can't stand it. But, um, but Qu- Quincy, shush. But, um, so for two hours, I play a game. And then from 11 o'clock to around 2 o'clock, I'll watch the horror stuff that, um, that, uh, Steph's not really big on. Well, she did watch. Knock at the knock at the cabin. But that wasn't really a horror movie. That was just a psychological. That was more of a psychological thriller. Do you have a favorite horror movie? Oh, of absolutely. Tex- Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original. Original, absolutely, without question. Because not just because it's still effective to this day, but because it was made for almost nothing. Um, yeah, it made for all like like college students making a movie, and uh, it's still so effective to this day. Uh, when I was when I was back home recently, my dad had never seen it. My dad's in his 80s now, and he'd never seen it. So I was like, Dad, watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre with me. So we watched it, and he usually fought, he either talks through a whole movie or he falls asleep. He was awake. <laughs> he was awake the entire time, and when we got done, he just looked at me and goes, "What a freak show!" <laughs> and I was, I was like, "Yeah, it's this. It's that effective still to this day." And I, I, it's got an atmosphere that no other movie has been able to match. And that atmosphere is achieved simply because they didn't have the money. And I love the mm. story. You know, John Larroquette is the narrator at the beginning that narrates the opening crawl. And he was paid for his work with a single uh, joint. <laughs> that, was, that, was, oh, that, was his, that was his payment for doing the narration in the original Texas Chainsaw. Now, wow. the second one was good, but every sequel after that has been absolute trash. Can't <laughs> yeah. stand it. Can't stand um, it. The, you know, the remake is good, though. When when you speak of a, a movie that was made for such little money, but uh, ends up being very effective, one of my favorite horror movies of all time is uh, Sam Raimi's uh, The Evil Dead. Oh, that yeah. was made for next to nothing, and the direction is out of this world. Yeah. I think Bruce Campbell is at his best there, and uh, I think they they hit gold for with that movie for sure. Absolutely, yeah. and and you know you can't you can't you can't push evil dead by the wayside because that director just directed doctor strange in the multiverse of madness it's like the guy's got chops the guy's got chops and they're undeniable and i love the fact that that core group are all still such friends they're all such good friends and um joel and eat the cohen brothers they're still friends with all of them and i think that's, that's, that's i think i would love to see the biographical story of that group making evil dead because that's yes. what's been done is that, has that been done? Because I read uh, I If Chins so. Could Kill. If Chins Could Kill was Bruce Campbell's first autobiography. Um, 
It's called If Chins Could Kill, a Confessions of a B-Movie Actor. And it, it talks extensively about that whole process. The night's freezing in that cabin with no heat and wow. uh, very little food and everything they all sacrificed in the making of that movie. It, it would be, if it was put on film, it would be difficult to believe to the layman who didn't know the actual story. It wouldn't be believable. Wow. Yeah, and they barely made any money, uh, the actors making that movie too. Oh, so. no, no, they didn't make, no, Texas Chainsaw <laughs> was the same way. Yeah. Texas Chainsaw was, I mean, they froze in Evil Dead and Texas Chainsaw Gunnar Hansen wore that same shirt for three weeks without washing it. <laughs> and Gunnar and Gunnar Hansen is over 300 pounds in the Texas mm. sun. So you got to imagine how nasty that shirt was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so got a little off track there. But yeah, Texas Chainsaw, <laughs> hands down, favorite movie of all time. Nice. Very nice. Unshakable. Um, what would you say is your favorite food? The favorite food? Um... <laughs> when I first got here, I tried scallops for the first time as an adult. Nah, I had a scallop nice. when I was a kid and it was disgusting, but I was like six years old. And I moved yeah. here and my, my wife got the scallops and I tried one of hers and I immediately was like, I don't want this anymore. I want more of those. So I love a good, <laughs> I love a good, a good seared scallop, um, nice. a really good meatloaf mm, to me. Yes. To, to me, there's nothing more depressing than a dry meatloaf. It ruins mm -hmm. my month. Oh. It ruins my whole month. And uh, I, I, one thing I did, one thing I'd still, one of the few things I still miss from Chicago is uh, a good deep dish pizza. Mm. <laughs> a good deep dish. Me too. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah? Many years. You, got, you have deep dish in Australia? No, no. Um, oh, you don't? You, okay. No, you can get like different styles. They, they sell like, you know, New York style and stuff, but I don't think anything beats a... Uh, a genuine deep dish in Chicago. No, no. From uh, from Pizzeria Uno or Pequod's or... Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny, people say, you know, one slice is enough. And I'm like, that's not enough. But you get halfway <laughs> through and you're like, it's enough. <laughs> it's enough. Yeah. 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 People compare... People say it's not pizza. It's a casserole. It's like, yeah. no, it's not. It's pizza. <laughs> it's in a triangle. It's pizza. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, if you were granted the gift of one superpower for one day... What would you choose and why? Oh my goodness. Uh, I only get one, one. Um, it's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Um, it might be, and this, this, this is going to sound weird. It might be to hear animals thoughts. Mm. Ah, <laughs> okay. And, and to communicate with them. That would be interesting. But that, that would be interesting. Um, a doctor but then again who knows uh, who knows if they even have any thoughts <laughs> <laughs> so that would be a useless superpower um a goldfish oh a tree oh a tree <laughs> oh a tree <laughs> 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 round and round we go <laughs> um maybe maybe invisibility oh yeah okay the invisibility there's so many um mm. yeah and i know that the minute this is over i'm gonna think of the really cool one <laughs> <laughs> oh well, it's not really a superpower. It's more like a myth, like a mystical power. Maybe the power to enter people's dreams. Mm. Oh, that would be cool. That's, That's more of a Freddy thing. But <laughs> yeah, the dream but, realm. <laughs> yeah, something like that. the dream realm. Very nice. Mm. Um, and final question: If you found a genie lamp somewhere and you were granted three wishes, what would they be? I jeez, I mean. Living in Galena here, I wouldn't I wouldn't wish for happiness because I've already got it. And with my wife, I already got that happiness covered. Um, I would just want I would I would wish for people to think more before they talk. Um, mm. I wish for a Silent Hill one remake. <laughs> <laughs> and and I would I would wish uh I would wish I would wish that nobody out there had ill feelings towards me. Mm. I think, even though it's a little nice. bit selfish, but I, I I think I'm that nobody nobody's out there actively hating me right now. I don't think. <laughs> no, I don't think if so. They, <laughs> if they if they if they are, they haven't made themselves known. They're just waiting for the right <laughs> moment. But that's that's yeah. Those would be my three. Very good. Very nice. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us, man. This has been a my blast. pleasure. I love it, man. Um, 
say, is there anywhere uh, on the internet that uh, fans can find you at? Do you have any social medias or things like this? Not for anything. Just okay. my regular Facebook and that sort of thing. That there's never, and I don't have like a an, an Insta or anything that. I'm not looking for followers. There you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm just I'm, content. I'm, 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 I'm 52 years old. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have to check on them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, before we go to you, is there anything you'd like to promote at this time? Um, maybe you can tell the audience once more about, uh, yeah, the whole ghost hunting thing. Yeah, uh, if you ever find yourself in Galena, Illinois, it's uh, it's just in the northwest corner on the, at the border of Wisconsin and Iowa. And uh, the company is called the Haunted, Galena, the Haunted Galena Tour Company, and it's the Haunted Galena Ghost Walk that I do. Um, so yeah, and it runs between April 15th and the day before Halloween because we don't do Halloween because our little town of Galena of 3,200 people hosts about 30,000 people for our annual Halloween parade. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. Also go to that if you get a chance because it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you guys. Very this nice. was great. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. This has been a dream. I love it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's, it's so nice to hear that you still to this day love the character. Um, it's so refreshing to hear because he was he was a, he was a great concept and it was a, it was a privilege to play him. That's the, the one intro that I can pop up and I get goosebumps every time I hear your voice. <laughs> yeah, but I'm also changed our lives, man. But I'm also Shang Tsung in that opening video too. That's true. I'm, again, I'm yeah, the, yeah, and it's Herman Sanchez who's Quan Chi. He goes, "What are you doing?" Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, guys. Thank you so, Thank right, you so much. All, All right, right take care. Okay, guys and gals, there you have it. I can almost guarantee you that you had chills hearing Max's voice, as he has such an iconic voice, and Conquest has honestly changed a lot of people's lives for the better. It was a great time in Mortal Kombat history, and we hope something of that fashion returns one day. We cannot thank you enough for joining us today. We really appreciate the people that support Kamandogu and help spread the word. Until next time, combatants, have fun, stay safe, and stay flawless.